Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from the King James. I'll start at verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I cause it to be that each one of us, myself included, that, that uh, we hear and we understand what it is that you want us to learn from this passage this morning. And Father, not just to hear it and to understand it and then to, to walk away from, from the, the service this morning and kind of forget it, but uh, Father, cause it to be that this is something, the message that you have for us this morning is something that continues to come to our mind and teach us how you want us to be applying it throughout the week. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. We began tackling this idea last week of the suffering of believers, the persecutions and the tribulations being part of God's righteous judgment. Especially in the midst of those who have rejected God, the persecutors, the one who are doing the persecuting, getting off scot-free. We, we began looking at this last week. How could that be? We saw in part, however, that this righteous judgment of God, this righteous judgment of God is not something that's made fully evident right now. And to the Thessalonians, it wasn't something that was made fully evident to them right now. The whole picture, it was not that the whole picture of God's righteous judgment was being manifested then or right now. It's not made fully evident now, but it will be seen carried out sometime in the future, during and following the day of the Lord, when retribution is made. When the Thessalonians, believers today, the Thessalonians, were marvelously rewarded for demonstrating patience and steadfast faith in the goodness of God during these times of tribulation and persecutions. We found this to be consistent with Paul's letter to the Romans, where he wrote to the, letter, he wrote to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 18. He said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's a time when believers are marvelously rewarded, and he's, he's talking about a time when the rejectors of God, the persecutors, those that are causing much of the suffering, will receive the great and terrible wrath of God. We're going to learn a little bit more about this wrath of God later on in this book, in this letter that Paul wrote. But we also read about it in 1 Thessalonians a few months ago when this wrath was described as a long-lasting, slow-burning, this festering, unpacifiable rage that will ultimately end in eternal destruction, in eternal lake of fire. So we saw that this represented a marvelous reward that was to come for the faithful and patient believers amidst their struggling persecutions, but also an unquenchable wrath for the persecuting unbelievers. 
So we concluded in this way that it was in this way that the faithful and patient suffering of the Thessalonians was a token of God's righteous judgment. It was, it was a token in the sense that their faithfulness, their faithfulness and their patience was showing that a future retribution would occur. A future retribution would occur when all the injustices would be accounted for, rectified, when things seem unfair. When things seem unfair, persecutions, trials, difficulties, remain focused on Christ. Remain focused on Christ. And demonstrate faithfulness, patience, trust, constantly, consistently, confidently rest in him. And know that a day of reward will come. The day of reward will come. And when it does, you too will see that that remaining faithful during those trials, during those persecutions and those tribulations, as difficult as it might have been, as difficult as it now can seem, will have been by far worth the immeasurable blessing that we'll then be experiencing. Now most of us, aren't experiencing severe persecutions and tribulations like the Thessalonians were and the early church. That being said, you and I can sometimes find it a little bit difficult or challenging to understand how this passage really relates to us. We aren't going through severe persecutions and tribulations like the Thessalonians did. The trials that we face today, however, whatever they are, whatever they are, have the same practical application as the severe trials and persecutions did with the Thessalonians. The same practical application. It's not the severity. It's not the longevity of the trial that makes it intentionally useful in your life. Rather, it's your focus on Christ in it, and it's your response through Christ of it that makes it useful. Listen to that again. It's not the severity. It's not how bad the trial is. It's not as though, well, I'm not going through anything like the Thessalonians, so I I guess I don't really relate to this. It's not the severity of it. It's not the longevity. It's not how long your trial or or your difficulties last that makes it intentionally useful in your life. But it's your focus. It's your consistent Streamlined focus on Christ in whatever that trial is. And it's your response through Christ in that trial that makes it useful. Whether you're facing life-threatening situations, threats, or whether what you're facing are kind of the regular tensions and stresses of everyday life that are part of daily living. It's, It's your faith in Christ And it's your joyful, patient, this is important, it's your joyful and patient response during those situations that will be a reason for those future and marvelous rewards that Paul's referring to here. So as we continue looking at this passage, keep this perspective in mind. Recognize that these verses apply not just to extreme situations and extreme cases, but they also apply to us, to you, to me, in whatever daily struggle or tension or trial that you and I are going through as a result of someone else's wrongdoing to us as believers or even as a result of temptations that just exist around us. Verse 4 and 5, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. And I ask, I ask those of you who could be here last week to, to take a look at that verse this week to read the verse, do some study on it, to read the passage, the preceding verses, the following verses, the chapter. Because there's a lot of differences in understanding regarding this verse. Differences that specifically have to do with how kingdom of God is defined and what it means for you and I to be counted worthy. What 
it meant for the Thessalonians to be counted worthy. One thing I want to point out to you first is that this phrase, kingdom of God, kingdom of God is not talking, this is important, not talking, kingdom of God here is not talking about eternal life. The kingdom of God here is not talking about eternal life. Paul is not suggesting that one may become worthy of receiving eternal life. He's not suggesting that somehow by going through enough sufferings and responding to them in the right way, that we can somehow be making ourselves worthy of receiving eternal life. He's not saying, for example, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that because of how you've responded to these sufferings, you are making yourselves deserving of forgiveness and eternal life for which you also suffer. That's not the intention of the verse. That's not what Paul's saying. If he were, then Paul's entire explanation, Paul's entire explanation of the gospel of grace being only a result of Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross and his resurrection, not by any works that we do, this gospel that he repeats in this letter and throughout all of his letters from all different kinds of angles, like in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God, lest any man should boast. All of that would be completely discredited if Paul here were trying to tell them that they could respond well enough to persecutions and tribulations and therefore kind of merit their way into eternal life. That's not what he's saying. There is, however, a correlation that he's making between their present response to persecutions and the future kingdom of God. But again, their response is not about making, the, he's not talking about themselves making themselves better, and he's not, he's not implying that the future kingdom of God is eternal life. They aren't the same thing. When you and I are valuing the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, when we are valuing, when we look at the Holy Spirit's work and we, we find that something of great value, then in that we are dying to ourself, dying to our flesh, in order that Christ can be living through us. I must decrease, right? I must decrease so that Christ can increase, so that he can increase. When we're valuing the work of the Holy Spirit, we aren't walking in self-striving. We aren't walking in our flesh or in our own works. We're being increasingly controlled by the Holy Spirit because we're valuing the work that he's doing, that he longs to do in our lives. We're being increasingly controlled by him walking into greater spiritual maturity, exhibiting the growth of his fruit through us. This is God's plan. This is his plan from the beginning. He justified us at the cross, and it's that same cross that progressively sanctifies us, right? That makes us, makes us become more like him, exhibiting the growth of that Christ-like fruit. As he matures us, he, God, the Holy Spirit, is equipping us He's preparing us. He's making us fit. Not in and of ourselves, not in our flesh. Not of our old nature. Old nature has been crucified. Not a result of works that we're doing, but it's a result of the work that he is doing in us, making us fit for something greater. Making us fit for something greater. But again, the equipping is not something that is going to be the result of more and more works in the flesh. Not a result of our flesh. Our equipping is a result of our dying more and more to our flesh so that he can increase. If in our persecutions, and you fit in whatever kind of word you want to put in there, if in your persecutions, if you... If you look at your life and you're like, I'm not really being persecuted. If you're in your trials, in your temptations, in the areas in each of your own personal lives in which you are really feeling attacked, either by other people, by Satan, by your flesh, if in our persecutions we are not dying 
to our flesh, we will not be equipped, we will not be prepared, and we will not be counted worthy for something greater, like this kingdom. Understand, not all believers will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Not all believers will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. All believers, all believers have received eternal life. Every single one of us who believe on Jesus Christ as our Lord, who believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. All of us who believe on Jesus Christ as the Savior, the one who came and he died on the cross for our sins, took all of our sins, the penalty of our sin, took all of that on the cross and died and resurrected, rose again, showing that he had conquered death and hell. Giving us, the, giving us new life inside of us. All of us who believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior are saved and have eternal life. But only, only those who are dying to self, who value the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, only they, like the Thessalonians were doing, will be counted worthy of this kingdom of God. So what is it? What is he talking about here? The kingdom of God. This concept of kingdom of God is a real important one. I'll tell you, there are so many. I, I asked some, some, some pretty well-versed people this week what that term meant. And, and across the board, the response was, well, it, it means salvation. It means saved. It means, you know, where you're going to spend. This kingdom of God refers to a time period. Refers to a time period following the second coming of Christ where Jesus literally reigns as king from Jerusalem. It's that literal time period. It's a dispensation before which the Antichrist has been thrown permanently into the lake of fire and Satan is bound, preventing either one of them from having any kind of impact on the earth at all. It's a time period during which men and women will live and have children and live under the authority of the perfect, loving King Jesus, Holy Christ. And they will prove through their own self-wills, just like in, in every dispensation of time, they will prove again that man's heart will rebel and reject God, even when he's being ruled by a perfect Savior. This period of time will last for a thousand years, the millennium. After this period of time, Satan will be loosed and he'll lead a worldwide revolt against Christ with all of mankind who rejected him during that time period, resulting in a fierce and furious, but very blazingly quick, permanent sending of all of Christ's enemies into the eternal lake of fire for all of eternity. And that will be the eternal damnation and burning of Satan and all those who rejected Christ. Now during those 1,000 years when Christ is reigning, he will be reigning as king a millennium, but he won't be reigning alone. He will be reigning but he won't be reigning alone. Christ will have those ruling alongside of him, those who have been counted worthy of the kingdom of God. That's the phrase. Christ during that millennial reign, that 1,000 year millennial reign, will have those ruling alongside, ruling and reigning with him, those who have been counted worthy of the kingdom of God. That's what Paul is talking about here. Your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Their faith, the Thessalonians' faith, was being tested. It was being given opportunities to fail, be challenged, given opportunities to fall by the wayside, be replaced by, by some kind of a temporary relief of the flesh. But for the Thessalonians, they weren't interested in the flesh. 
They weren't interested in relief. Let me say that. They weren't interested in relief from the persecutions and the tribulations that were going on. We find out later, of course, that they, just like we and all believers, continue to struggle and deal with the flesh. But they weren't interested in some kind of a relief from all the persecutions and tribulations. They wanted to be joint heirs with Christ. And they wanted to identify more closely with the one who gave himself for them. Listen to these verses, Romans 8, 16 to 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, regardless of how tough they are. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12a, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. The Thessalonians, they weren't focusing on being happy, any kind of personal fulfillment or personal comfort. They weren't focused on self-satisfaction or success. They weren't focused on being appreciated or popular or well-liked, focusing on prosperity or psychological self-help methods. They got it. In this area, they were grasping, they were focusing on Christ. In response to their sufferings, in response to their sufferings, we might have heard them say something like this. You know what? That's fine. That's fine. We don't care about this world. We know that the fact that we suffer and go through trials is a tool through which God is teaching us and training us, developing his purposes through us. We know the fact that we go through it, suffer through these trials is a, is a, is a picture of him equipping us. He's using these things in our lives. They were dying to their flesh. Friends, that is a difficult thing for us to do when we are not valuing the work of the Holy Spirit. Understand that if, if you're valuing the work of the Holy Spirit, you're going to value the hardships and the trials that come up in your life not looking at them as some kind of a, a tragic thing that you have to get away from or, or be, you know, look at them and, and do what Ron suggested this morning. Look at them and, and ask God, what is it that you want to teach me through this? There's something that you want to do in my life through this. And, and my flesh wants to get away from it and say, uh-uh, I am not going through that. I am not dealing with that. You know what? That's a telltale sign, if that's what you're listening to in your life, if that's what's driving you, that you are not valuing the work of the Holy Spirit. Because it's those very things that the Holy Spirit uses in your life. The Thessalonians were dying to their flesh. In this area, their focus was on Christ, Christ's return, and as such, they were being matured. They were being counted, they were being considered, called to be not merely spectators or bystanders or not merely residents of the kingdom of God, but, but they were being prepared in a way that God would call them worthy of ruling. Ruling and reigning alongside the Lord Jesus Christ in this 1,000 year millennial reign. 
The challenge that you and I are met with today in light of Paul's letter is a real one. As much as we talk about the importance of sanctification, being made into the image of Jesus Christ, appreciating the hardships and give us opportunity for us to grow, as much as we talk about these things, each one of us, myself included, each one of us has so much to learn about really letting the Spirit live His methods and His life through us. Sometimes our own responses to trials don't line up as people who are interested in ruling or reigning with Christ. Sometimes they don't line up as people who are interested in suffering or identifying with Jesus Christ. Sometimes our responses to our hardships reveal hearts that more highly value our personal comfort and relief. Instead of demonstrating patience, we offer complaints. Instead of appreciating our trials and valuing the resulting fruit that God wants to grow in us through them, instead of appreciating them, and they offer sarcastic comments, instead of walking through hardships and difficulties, we'll walk through them with some kind of an outward obedience while inwardly disgusted at the personal sacrifice that it causes us. And this is our attitude. We're demonstrating a lack of faith and a lack of value in what God wants to do in us. And despite our outward behavior, despite how compliant we are, despite how obedient we act, we're focusing on our flesh. And choosing at those times to believe that it is our flesh that is more valuable than the Holy Spirit's work in us. That it is our flesh that is more valuable. It is our flesh that is more deserving of our focus than Jesus Christ. Remember, the Thessalonians were not counted worthy of the kingdom of God because they went through persecution. You understand that? The Thessalonians were not counted worthy of the kingdom of God because they went through the persecutions or because they were dealt persecutions or because they were dealt difficult things in their lives. All of us, believers and unbelievers are like, we are all dealt things in our lives that are difficult. The Thessalonians were counted worthy because they went through the persecutions with faith and patience. If you just get through trials and struggles and temptations, there is little or no reward because if you're just getting through them, your focus is still on your flesh. Only when we respond, when we walk through trials and struggles and temptations, only when we're doing that in the Spirit, in other words, only when we're walking through them and we're in the midst of them denying our flesh, and its selfish desires. Only then, when we're focusing on Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to, to respond through us in those trials in a way that Christ would have us do, only then are we demonstrating Christ's likeness and only then are we being prepared as to be counted worthy to reign with Christ. What value our trials and persecutions and tribulations and temptations and difficulties, what value they have in our lives. We as a church need to stop looking at them and trying to get away from them and looking at them as though they're some kind of an enemy to us and realize that God has a strong and real purpose in us that is going to be one that provides eternal rewards because of what he wants to do through us. In them. Now, if you don't want to crucify your flesh, if you want to hold on to bitterness and resentment and self-entitlement and decide that you want to try to escape every difficult thing that comes your way, 
If you want to hide behind sarcastic or caustic comments or responses, or if you want to be walking through the emotion, the motions of doing the right thing, but keeping some kind of a reactive attitude about life. <laughs> Friends, if you've believed on Jesus Christ as your Savior, that kind of an attitude will not get you out of heaven. You will not lose your salvation for having that kind of an attitude. If you choose as a believer to hold on to your flesh at times when temptations arise and tragedies and difficulties strike you, if you choose to hold on to your flesh, that will not remove you from the book, the book where your name is written in the book of eternal life. Your name will not be removed from there. If you have believed on Jesus Christ, it is an eternal thing. But if you aren't honoring and respecting and treasuring the God-given opportunities presented to you for the purpose of giving you the privilege of identifying with Christ in his sufferings, if you're treating those opportunities as though they are a bother to you, as though you are above being put out in that way, then your temporal focus on this physical and fleeting world will prevent you from ever enjoying the ruling and reigning and other special and other eternal rewards reserved for those who value who Christ is. Jesus Christ is the one who died to save you. The eternal, you all know this, the eternal, self-existent one who saves, saves, and keeps you, and defends you. And it's because of him that, that we can have a joyful expectation of blessing and reward in the very center, in the very center of life's trials. Every one of them. You can understand, value what Christ did you can understand and value what Christ did and be saved. But only when you long to understand, only when you value who Christ is, only when you value who Christ is, will you have reason to actually welcome all the opportunities to identify with him and suffer with him, cherishing the time when alongside him, you long terrain. We need to stop approaching each day as though trials are an interruption. Approach each day with an expectation of trials. Approach each day in an expectation of trials and a joyful anticipation of them because of the opportunity to identify with Christ through them, because of the fruitful produce that God will grow in you through them, and because of the eternal rewards that God will one day offer you because of your faith and patience through them. I'm going to ask Richard to come up and close us in prayer. And as he's coming up, I'm going to read that to you. Approach each day with an expectation of trials and, and a joyful anticipation of them because of the opportunity to identify with Christ through them? Understand, when you're looking at trials as some kind of an enemy and an unwanted thing in your life, you're losing out on opportunities to identify with Christ, the one who gave his life for you. Look at the trials with a joyful anticipation because of the opportunity to identify with Christ, because of the fruitful produce that he will grow in you through them, and because of the eternal rewards that God has for you in them.